All right, folks, let's get started. My name is Adam Walter. I'm the marketing director here at Cheeseman's Ecology Safaris. Uh, I want to introduce some of the players that we have on the line today. We have Patty Collins. She's our wildlife safari coordinator specifically for this Zimbabwe trip. We also have Mark Sison and Mark Butcher uh, here from Envelo Safaris. Uh, they're going to do a nice little presentation for everybody uh, for Zimbabwe Wonders, exploring the jewel of Africa. It'll cover everything from the natural beauty, the cultural beauty, some of the um, local conservation efforts that they do have going on in, with Mbello, as well as our Cheeseman's trip in September 2024. So I hope everyone is ready. You guys have all your pith helmets on. Uh, Mark, go ahead, take it away. If you guys have any questions in the interim, uh, be sure to put them in the chat. At the end, we're going to do a Q&A session so you guys can ask whatever questions that you may have. Um, I'll field them in the chat if there's something that's happening in the moment. Uh, so hopefully we can feel that properly. Uh, so without further ado, Mark, Butch, take it away. Thanks very much, uh, Adam. Thank you very much. And good evening to all of you. I'm talking to you from uh, Bulaway and Zimbabwe here. It's 8 p.m. Uh, I'm a two or three hour drive away from uh, Wangi National Park, which is my beloved part of uh, Zimbabwe, Africa. And uh, I'm here to talk to you this evening about um, uh, what we do in Wangi National Park in the Victoria Falls area of Zimbabwe. And um, before I go any further, I think I need to thank Adam and uh, Patty for giving us the opportunity for me to talk about uh, one of the most wonderful parts of Africa, uh, beyond doubt. And I'm Zimbabwean, I'm biased, so forgive me. Um, big thing about Envelos Fori Lodges here is we are um, we are uh, Zimbabwe owned. Uh, we're not owned by any foreign companies, and all of our staff come from. Uh, villages and communities right around Wangi National Park in the Victoria Falls area. Uh, our guiding team are local guides in the sense they're not just Zimbabwean, but they actually come from our part of the world. And I love that picture on the top right. Those are some of our guides supporting National Parks patrols during the COVID years when we didn't have any tourists here, but we still looked after our wildlife. The lower right there is Vusa Ngobe, who's our head guide, grew up in a village, just a very short walk from uh, Ngamu Gate in Wangi National Park. And he's our, he spends his time today guiding people around on the uh, the plains of Ngamo where he, he grew up. And there's the three owners of Mbella. We're all Zimbabwean. None of us are foreigners. We're born and raised here and we're in love with Zimbabwe and very proud of our heritage. Thanks, Mark. Okay. And uh, one of the things we're very proud of is the fact that we really feel we have not only uh, we do great things in uh, our part of the world, but we've reinvented safaris, you know, uh, lots of unique things that we do in our part of the world, uh, all of which, any of you who are intrepid enough to come and join us next September, you're going to love the trip. But imagine riding on the Elephant Express. It's our private rail car along the railway line, northern boundary of Wangi National Park. Imagine seeing lions and stuff from a rail car. Um, the wet seasons, we go canoeing in Wangi Park down at Joe's Benini, one of the camps that are on the itinerary that Cheeseman's put together for you. We'll actually take you mountain biking down there. Imagine mountain biking with elephants. What a, uh, what a fantastic thing that is to come home with memories and photographs, that kind of thing. When we go and visit our communities, one of our favorite ways is not to drive in a bus to go and visit them. We love to walk to school with the kids. These are just a few of the kind of things that we can do. Everybody talks about experiential safaris. We really are experiential. Um, we're not about um, thread count on our sheets. We're not about five different kinds of French champagne. We're about fantastic activities. And, and this is critical to our whole ethos, giving back to our communities and giving back to our wildlife. Thanks, Mark. Um, Adam and Patty recommended to us that instead of boring you with a whole lot of details about uh, what the tents look like, a good way to open up this uh, presentation would be to tell you about uh, one of our conservation uh, activities. Uh, and this is a thing that you guys will be able to experience. You're going to spend at least an afternoon involved in it. You're going to see a lot of the stuff that uh, goes on with us. But it's the Community Rhino Conservation Initiative. Uh, and this goes back to uh, a lot of uh, my personal history. I've been in Wangi for over 40 years. I started as a ranger there in 1980. That's a picture taken by the folks from National Geographic in the early 1990s on a boundary on the boundary of Wangi National Park. And uh, one of the things we were doing at that time was trying to look after the elephant and rhino in this, in this uh, wonderful national park of ours. Um, and back when I was a young ranger, there were herds of white rhino in southern Wangi, in grasslands down there. Um, and they were uh, certainly a, a very, very important part of the ecology down there. But of course, in the Late 90s, particularly the early 2000s, we got hit by an avalanche of uh, poaching in our part of the world. 
We had poachers coming from all over Africa to come and get our rhino. They were talking French. They came from the Congo. They were talking Swahili. They came from uh, Somalia and Sudan uh, and came down and killed our rhino. And we lost all the white rhino in Wanga National Park. And that, to me, has always been something that's been very sad, sad. Um, and it's worried me for many, many years. Last white rhino was killed in Wanga National Park in about 2002. Um, and that brings us to some of what's going on in the larger picture. And this, I love maps, you know, and... Um, Anybody who uh, is involved in conservation uh, understands maps and the importance of them. And this map is of um, uh, this fantastic vision for what we have in Southern Africa called PASA. It's the Kavango Zambezi Trans Frontier Conservation Area. It's this vision for what the future of what wildlife might look like in our part of the world. Five countries, 14 national parks, half a million square kilometers. I'm not going to try and convert that to square miles, but it's vast. Okay. And within Kaza, and the numbers from the elephant count that was conducted in uh, last year just come out, 232,000 elephants, okay? By far the majority of the planet's population of African elephant lie within the boundaries of, of this vision for the future that we call Kaza. But what is also significant is the fact that there's less than 200 rhino, both black and white, that may be as few as 100 or 120 in that whole vast, uh, incredible conservation area and vision for the future. The scarcity of rhino is significant. When you narrow that down, the Wangi National Park, which is the oldest national park in what is today Kaza, is 5,000 square miles, nearly 50,000 elephant. Um, but we have less than 10 rhino here. They're black rhino. There's a small vestigial population of uh, rhino that survived the poaching onslaught up in the northern part of the park. They're not even a surviving population. Um, so when you take that forward, um, we've always had this idea about how do we reintroduce white rhino to Wangi National Park. Um, and our vision of the conservation, the community rhino conservation initiative is to do it differently. This is um, zooming in on the southern boundary of Wangi National Park. To the north of this picture is uh, Wangi National Park. And that kind of dark line that's running diagonally from left to right is the boundary of the park. And the southern sector there is the uh, communities that live around Wangi National Park. Okay, This particular boundary is the largest human and wildlife conflict zone that exists anywhere in Kaza. Huge numbers of wildlife, elephant, lion in particular, uh, the mega wildlife, and large numbers of people. Um, and every one of those icons on that map represents a community project that our organization has put on the ground uh, in those communities. And it might be school feeding, it might be school libraries, it might be classroom blocks, teachers blocks, it might be a, a solarized uh, borehole, it might be a new borehole. But even though we've done all of those things. And when you guys come and visit us, we, I can certainly give you the, the numbers. Um, hundreds hundreds of thousands of school meals every year. Uh, many, many thousands of patients treated by our uh, medical outreach. But all of that has still not been enough uh, for these communities that are really disadvantaged that live around our, our protected areas in, in this part of Africa. So that kind of led us to the next step, you know. And the next step was an interesting one because we said, okay, if we're going to reintroduce rhino into Wangi Park, what about reintroducing rhino instead of into the park per se on government land? Let's reintroduce them into community land. Okay, and that's my partner standing up there in Jabolo Zondo. He and I have been partners since 1996. I'm a game ranger. He's a social scientist. And he's got great skills in talking to people at every level of Zimbabwean society. But in particular, in this photograph, illustrates talking to uh, elders from the communities and the villages around the park. Okay, both men and women. And what he's talking to them about is, hey, guys, what about setting aside some land on your uh, community land and let's reintroduce rhino? Let's not put them on government land, but let's put them on community land. Uh, and what came out of this was in, uh, just before COVID hit, uh, right at the beginning of COVID, was these communities stood up and said, OK, we're going to set aside 200 hectares uh, for you guys, about 500 acres of their prime grazing land. It's around Camelthorn Lodge, one of our lodges next door to Wangi National Park, and we know it's traditionally was white rhino habitat back in the day. And they said, okay, we're going to set aside land for a rhino sanctuary, okay, the Mvelo and Gamo rhino sanctuary. Uh, and during 2020 and 2021, the terrible COVID years, these were the years that we developed the rhino sanctuary. It was really exciting because the first thing we had to do was, of course, find rangers who could come out um, and protect these rhino. And we elected right from the beginning. We weren't going to hire ex-soldiers or ex-policemen or even ex-game rangers. We're going to hire youngsters out of the communities. And these kids come out of the communities. 
They've been raising cattle. They've been looking after their family's livestock on this land for many years. And we look for the biggest, best and the brightest. And obviously, physical fitness and strength, determination, uh, a little bit of uh, mental courage uh, goes to part of the selection process. And um, then we took these uh, young guys out and we trained them up to British Army standards. Okay. Uh, it took several years. Uh, we decided we were going to train our rangers up to a level where they could stand up to the terrible uh, poaching onslaught that we we knew happened historically. It's going on in South Africa right now, in Namibia and all over our parts of Africa. We wanted to make sure our rangers, we call them Cobra Rangers, nice sexy name for them, but they were going to be well-armed, well-defended, I mean, well-equipped uh, uh, badasses, you know. Uh, and when the guys came back to at us from Congo or from Sudan or whatever, they would not only be able to look after themselves, but they'd look after the rhino that they're going to one day be in charge of. But these badasses are not just badasses. They're not an anti-poaching unit. We call them a community wildlife protection unit. They look after wildlife and they look after our communities. And that's a nice picture from COVID. You can see all the face masks there. But what our Cobra Rangers were doing were delivering school meals to the schools in our communities, talking to the kids, talking to them about conservation, talking to them about our vision for the future back then of bringing rhino back to their communities. And how much fun is it for a bunch of school kids who are very, very um, bored with uh, walking around in face masks, but they learn how to march with the Cobra Rangers. Christmas time down at Mchaeli School. These are kids for whom uh, they had never eaten an orange, but they got a chance to eat an orange. It's better than eating pizzas and cheeseburgers, let me tell you, if you've never eaten, eaten an orange before. And suddenly what happened is these Cobra Rangers became uh, heroes in their local community. Um, and this next picture kind of illustrates some of what, what I suddenly saw. And the first time I saw it, I nearly fell out of my, my vehicle and I drove past. But during break time, instead of playing soccer or football, what the kids were doing is they started to play Cobra Rangers. Okay, they were marching around, they were left, right, left, right, and they were singing Cobra songs because these kids, what they want to do when they grow up, they want to be Cobra Rangers. And this is a conservation law enforcement old game ranger like I am. This is the holy grail for us for conservation for the future, where the youngsters of our societies that live around our schools want to grow up and be rangers looking after rhinos and elephants and cool things like that. This all culminated in the early part of 2022. Uh, National Parks ground checking team came down for about the third or fourth time there. Uh, ecologists, uh, security guys, local community leaders and came together and we were given a thumbs up. Okay. They said that uh, our rhino sanctuary was ready to go and uh, we we're given approval for our first two rhino uh, to come into our, our uh, sanctuary. Okay. And we partnered up with the folks down at a place called Malalangwe in the southeast of our country. Um, it's a privately owned rhino sanctuary. And we presented to them uh, our vision for the future. And our little vision for the future was the Community Rhino Conservation Initiative. Okay. And this was going to be a rhino conservation model as well as a socioeconomic uh, development model. Um, we went down to the folks at Malalangwe and they gave us a thumbs up. They said they would support us and they would donate rhino to us. Um, and I went down there in the early part of May last year and found uh, I relived what I'd seen as a young range in Wangi, you know, herds of white rhino again, black rhino everywhere. These folks got over 400 rhino there. Last year they had nearly 50 calves, you know, it's an extremely successful rhino program. And it's also only a day's walk from the Mozambique border. Mozambique is obviously quite a wild frontier country where a lot of poachers come from. And these guys have done a fantastic job of looking after their rhino. And, uh, Early on the morning of 5th of May, that was the day it was set aside for the capture of our two rhino that were going to come up to us. Helicopters arrived. Diesel in my car and checking the pressure in my tires and doing all kinds of things. But by 7.30 that day, they'd located the two rhino from us. And there's a legendary vet, Chris Foggin, hang out the side of that uh, chopper there and managed to get a couple of darts into the first rhino, which was for us. And his number was 803. He later became named Tuza. And you folks that come and join us in September will be uh, be able to meet Tuza and Kusasa. And uh, Tuza actually took two um, uh, dart loads of tranquilizer. You can see them in his bum there, M99. And uh, straight off, he being tranquilized. We fitted him with a, a radio transmitter on the side of his horn. You can see the knob there. And uh, next thing is you wake them up about halfway and you've got to load them into a truck. Um, so you reverse the M99 with a, a drug called M5050. Um, and we get them up on their feet and then uh, secured with ropes and blindfolds, get them into that rhino crate 
that Rhino Creek has then swung onto the back of a uh, big six-wheel drive vehicle. Um, and from there, he's transported from the field where he's been captured to a holding boma. And the boma is kind of like you guys might call it back at Malalangwe headquarters where he was held. And then we went out and fetched the second one. And by lunchtime that day, we caught two rhino, 803 and 204. And uh, they were in the holding boma there where they're going to settle down and make sure there's no post-capture stress. And um, we'd come back and pick them up. Uh, I returned to Malalangwe on the 21st of May, a couple of weeks later. The rhino had done well. They'd settled down. They were very close friends already. We knew that. And um, we got we had to do things in reverse now, tranquilize them again and load them onto the crate and then start that very long road trip all the way from the southeast of our country, Malalangwe there next to Gonorajor National Park. Uh, 720 kilometers, nearly 500 miles, 17-hour road trip across our country. Uh, we started about 6 or 7 p.m. and arrived where we needed to be in Chilocho communal land on the boundary of Wanga National Park, uh, late morning the next day, exhausted, rhinos exhausted, stressed. Um, but as soon as we turned off the tar road, the first thing that happened is the Cobra Rangers were there to meet us. They jumped on the back of the truck, immediately surrounded the truck where they were going to protect their rhinos and ride their rhinos all the way in. And uh, brought tears to my eyes back then. I cried like a baby. It was fantastic. But there were people lining the sides of the road. Local villagers lined up and were welcoming uh, their rhino coming to come and stay on their land. We're going to be part of their communities. Proud Cobra Rangers guarding them there. Uh, school kids were out, school teachers, community leaders, just lining the sides of the roads as that, as that truck drove those rhino in. Rhino arrived into the sanctuary. We closed the gates on them, uh, offloaded the crates, uh, opened the rhino up and put them into their holding boma at our side. And it was just a huge moment. Very two vehicles follow us on that convoy just local people coming and joining us and right from the beginning and this is an important part of this project was that anybody who wanted to come and see our riders you pay to go to the national park you pay to come to the rhino conservancy and from day one uh, international visitors uh visiting us started to pay their rhino conservation levy and there's the first check that came out to the local communities there and there's babo Mlevo, uh the father of wildlife conservation our part of the world and chief marapul himself who received the check that day for their uh, first revenue from having rhino on their land. Very exciting for them. What was interesting, what followed on from this, was in parallel around about the same time we started developing uh, a science base. And that's uh, Sarah Clegg on the left, Dr. Sarah Clegg, who's the uh, one of the wildlife biologists down in Malalungwe. And there she is handing over DNA samples to Hannah Tranter, who's the head of our trust at, um, at our rhino sanctuary. And there's our DNA samples that are going into storage as the start of uh, uh, some of the science that's going to be behind this uh, developing rhino conservancy. Um, what was also interesting is that on the um, on the periphery of our rhino sanctuary, uh, we suddenly found out we had all kinds of things going on here. And one of them was that these rhino were pretty stretched out from the trip. They'd lost a lot of condition, arriving in a new place, a new area, uh, and also weather conditions very, very different. Uh, our part of Africa is a lot cooler than Malalangwe, where they'd come from. Nighttime temperatures sometimes drop to zero during June, July. And these rhino were stressing with cold. So we had to supplementary feed them right from the beginning, try and get their um, body condition back up. And very quickly, within about a month, we turned it around. I was very excited to uh, find when they took to alfalfa. Uh, it took them a couple of weeks to figure it out. But once they figured it out, they really took to it. And there's proud Cobra Rangers guarding them while they are in there holding Burma on our side. And their condition is starting to improve very quickly. And straight away, one of the things that happened was that um, people started to visit the rhino, okay? Not only international tourists coming uh, that were visiting our camps and taking pictures, uh, taking pictures not just of any rhino, but these really exciting, the first community-based white rhino to be reintroduced onto community land, and of course, local villages. Local villages still arrive every day, come down to Hotel Charlie, our headquarters, and say, please, please, can we go and see our rhino? Cobra Rangers escort them in, they go and see them. But again, This culminates in a visit down to Hotel Charlie, where they get to talk about rhino, rhino conservation from the Cobra Rangers. They get a, a bottle of uh, Mazoe orange as well. That's Zimbabwe equivalent of Gatorade. 
and everybody loves their uh, Missouri Orange. But uh, best chance for these kids is to now meet these legends, these Cobra Rangers. And on the right, there's Kwanel Ngube. Uh, his nickname's actually Poacher. Uh, and he's talking to these kids. What's he talking to those kids about? Talking about rhino conservation. He's talking about conservation. He's also talking to them about, hey, guys, you see a stranger uh, in your village. You see a stranger driving around or looking around. Be sure to tell your folks, tell your teachers, come and tell us there's a stranger in the village and let's check him out. Make sure it's not one of the baddies come down from up north to come and get our rhino. So straight away, we've got hundreds and hundreds of young eyes on the ground keeping their eyes open. And of course, everybody loves the picture at the end. You get the picture with your orange before you head back to the village uh, where you're going to go and tell stories about Kuza and Kusasa. And keep your eyes open for strangers. Um, look at that picture there. I love that picture. There's our Cobra Rangers. So terribly proud. Uh, they've now got jobs in an area when in, uh, employment might be as uh, unemployment might, might might be as high as 95 percent. These kids don't have to go elsewhere to South Africa to go and look for a job. They're employed walking distance from their village. They're trained up to be the best of the best. They're well armed, well equipped, well paid, and they're doing what they've been trained to do for the past two or three years. Um, real exciting stuff. And this picture here, this little video, uh, is going to tell you a little bit about what you can do when you come next September on this trip and you can come and interact with these rhino. And really is fantastic because, um, Mark, give me a thumbs up if you guys can hear sound on your side. I can't. Give me a thumbs down if you can't. I've got a thumbs down. All right, I'll talk you through it. Okay, here's Tuzan Kusasa. Uh, and uh, we've got visitors coming from all over the world to visit them. Um. And the first thing that happens, of course, is you go down to Hotel Charlie, you get the talk, so you understand about the Rhino Project and you learn about it. And it's really interesting because it's uh, not only about international visitors, but also about what I've been talking about, uh, kids and people from the communities to come and visit these Rhino. And what I do love is that um, these Rhino, because they're guarded 24-7 by the Cobra Rangers, have really become kind of habituated to the Cobra Rangers, which means when you visit our Rhino, you can now walk with the Cobra Rangers and you can walk with these rhino. And man, you can walk within 10 or 15 feet to these rhino and the rhino are perfectly used to things because you're with the Cobra Rangers. And what a fantastic experience this is to walk with these fantastic beasts that are so threatened by uh, international gangsters and poachers that uh, now you can walk with them. Um, look, guys, I'm sorry in Bulawayo here, I can't see any video. So you're going to have to give me a, a hand signal here about... Uh, all right. Maybe we should just go on ahead there, uh, Mark. Let's go on to the next slide. Slides seem to be working better than video. It's probably Zimbabwean bandwidth that's something, got something to do with it. All right. Whoa. Okay. So one of the cool things, and I think the next slide that follows on from here is um, the fact that in parallel, uh, while we were developing the Rhino project, we were also developing a, a clinic at the nearby village okay just a short walk from this rhino uh conservancy uh we started to develop a, a clinic and what was interesting that that clinic services about five different villages um and all of the inhabitants of those villages were um until we opened this clinic about a 25 kilometer walk that's about 15 16 miles from the nearest health care so what we did is over time with a lot of help from uh, d uh guests and donors and supporters we built a clinic but straight away by um, September of last year, 2022, so within four months of the rhino arriving, local communities um, decided uh, to use their share of the uh, rhino conservation levy to fund their local clinic. So what they were really uh, worried about was that um, uh, pay for their nurses and pay for the people working at the clinic was often late and often short. But straight away from September last year, uh, our nurses there started getting paid in US dollars. And what was really important is that started purchasing all our own uh, medicines and medical requirements through uh, money generated out of the Rhino Conservation Levy from uh, visiting guests. So this to me, again, is a kind of this iconic, incredible moment when within four months of the Rhino arriving, we had free health care for five villages straight away, all paid for out of bringing rhino instead of onto some national park or into some rich white guys conservancy we put them on community land and straight away it started changing lives 
very, very exciting for us. Go on to the next slide there, Mark. Um, next thing that also follows here is we started collecting immense amounts of data. So every 15 minutes, we record a set of data from these rhinos. We've got patterns on their movement, which parts of the habitat they're using at different times of the year, different times of the day. We really know more about rhino in this uh, ecosystem than we knew from all the years I was a game ranger and the, the years that white rhino existed in Wangi National Park. And um, all kinds of fascinating data we're getting here in terms of what their activities are, uh, feeding, resting, other, uh, and comparing their condition and comparing that with rhino elsewhere in Africa, in this case with KZN. Really interesting to be able to get a, a really good handle on it. And the bottom line is applying some science this thing, our rhino are flourishing. They really are flourishing. They, they're in good condition. They are really settled down and they've it's really exciting. So we're calling phase one of this rhino program a, a, a success. In fact, it's an incredible success. But it's not just going to end at phase one. Phase two is ready to go. We've got another sanctuary all set up. We're just simply awaiting arrival of our rhino and I hope it's uh, imminent. On this map, again, we go to that map of the southern boundary of Wangi National Park. Wangi uh, Park is up to the north. The, the boundary running diagonally from left to right there. Sanctuary number one on the right-hand corner there. That's where it is. Um, and the vision for the future is not this, just one sanctuary, but a second, a third, a fourth, and a fifth sanctuary. Okay, Each sanctuary with a bunch of cobra rangers looking after a small number of rhino in a small area so they're well protected, hunts in protection, and one day link them together into a free-ranging rhino conservancy uh, between the park and the communities. And God willing, there's the holy grail for the future, reintroducing rhino back onto uh, this fantastic wilderness we call Wangi National Park. It's really exciting what's unfolding. And folks, you come and visit us in September next year. You can come and see it. You can come and taste it. You can come, come and be part of it. Um, without further ado, then, um, the next part of this presentation is... Uh, uh, what we're planning for you for next September. Um, and uh, this little map here uh, shows you the northwestern part of Zimbabwe, uh, Victoria Falls, up in the northwestern corner. It's this bucket list place that um, adventurers from all over the world want to come and visit at least once in your life. I visit a thousand times every time I go there. It raises hairs on my back and on my neck. And the um, itinerary that the folks at Cheesemans have lined up for you is a, is a super... Uh, uh, 10 night trip. First night, you arrive in Victoria Falls, the International Airport there. Short drive to Victoria Falls town. You stay at Ilala Lodge. And then from there, you move and you spend eight nights in Wangi National Park, experiencing all the wonderful things that, I, that I'm i so fond of and I love to show people about. Your last night, you go back up to uh, a beautiful place called the Palm River, right on the Zambezi River above the falls as a nice finisher. And I'm going to talk you through that trip now, step by step. First step, there it is, Ilala Lodge. It's a small boutique hotel well known for great service, good food, uh, great comfort. And uh, on the front veranda there, you actually get hit by the spray from the falls uh, on a cool day. And there it is, Victoria Falls, one mile wide, thousand feet high, biggest curtain of falling water uh, in the world, okay, on the Zambezi River. It's just an absolute joy. You can see the rainforest on the right-hand side there as you walk along, along the face of the falls and enjoy it. This is a picture from late September. The uh, Zambezi River will be low. Not so much spray, which gives you a great chance to see the falls and take pictures. Um, and it's just beautiful. It really is. Like I say, I've seen it a thousand times and it still raises the hair on the back of my neck. From Victoria Falls, we're then going to take you on day two after your arrival, take you down to our camp in the northern part of Wangi called Nahimba. And Nahimba is just fantastic. Um, this is a late dry season picture. This might have been taken in September. Conditions there, dry, uh, waterhole right in front of camp. Camp is in a semicircular in an arc around the waterhole and just strong with big wildlife. Elephants, buffalo, uh, lions, all kinds of stuff coming into the waterhole there. And you can see them right from your front deck. That's a picture taken about four o'clock, three o'clock in the afternoon. That's absolutely awesome. Uh, lots, that picture on the top left there, uh, swimming pool, you can see it there. Wangi's elephants don't differentiate between waterholes and swimming pools. And the ones at Nahimba, particularly so they don't really mind getting in the swimming pool. And they drink it dry by 4 or 5 p.m. And you're going to see this, that picture down the lower left. You will get that photograph of yourselves next September. You eating dinner surrounded by elephants that are down at the waterhole there. It's an absolutely fantastic event. Uh, the lions there are awesome. Uh, this is the pride horse. Horse was a famous matriarch that died last year, sadly. She built this incredible pride of lions. They're elephant hunters. They're buffalo hunters. They're just awesome, awesome lions. 
and you can see a picture of one of the uh, of the guest accommodation at the top right there. Very comfortable. We aspire to be four star. We're not five star, but it's very very comfortable. Uh, en suite bathrooms, flush loose, hot and cold running water, overhead fans, mosquito nets, and a beautiful outside shower on the deck there. Nothing more wonderful in my opinion than showering under the stars. And this next one is a video here. I hope it's going to play for you, but this you will see. Okay, this is the campfire at Nehemba just before dinner, and this is what you will experience. It is absolutely awesome. I say it's the best elephant show on the planet, and I'll argue with anybody that it is the case. Uh, give me a thumbs up. Everybody can see that video there. Playing, this one's playing, huh? Good, great. It's just, that's it. September next year. Uh, this is something that just, again, I've watched it hundreds of times, and just every time it happens, it thrills me. All the interactions between the bull elephants, interactions between the breeding herds. Absolutely fantastic. One of the wonderful, other wonderful places near Nehemba are the Nehemba Seeps. This is the one, one of the few parts in Wangi where the elephants dig for water. Great place for sundowners and adult beverage. And of course, this is where these elephants come and uh, get salts and throw this, uh, throw these white salts on themselves. I call it wall paint. Makes for some great photography. Um, these old bulls that come in from the west and cover themselves in wall paint. Um, that's our current uh, male in charge of uh, the Nehemba Pride. That's a photo Mark took last year, Italian last year, wonderful picture he took of the, the lion we call um, Stranger. A uh, story about why he's called Stranger, I'll tell you, we can tell you around the campfires next year. He's a gorgeous lion. Um, and a, uh, a father to a whole bunch more cubs, let me tell you. Um, the, this next picture is cool as well because it tells you about some of the things. We don't just do game drives in Wangi. We love to get out on foot. And you guys next year will get a chance to walk. Um, and uh, Zimbabwe's pro guides are, we say we're the best in Africa, and arguably we are. We have a six to 10 year training program before you're licensed to walk with a rifle in a national park. And uh, nothing quite as exciting as getting up on foot with Wangi's wildlife, and particularly these huge uh, six tons, 13,000 pound, uh, 12 foot to the shoulder bull elephants that are just, uh, Wangi's elephants well known for being well mannered, but it's still exciting and thrilling. And this is kind of a cool picture too. This is one that Mark put together. These are photos he took last year, the photos of some of the birds and bird life, all these exotic birds, all kinds of stuff, not just uh, the iconic, sexy, large mammals, but all these wonderful birds, uh, birds, uh, reptiles, insects, all kinds of fascinating things that are going on. Uh, and I love the fact that you guys call yourselves ecology safaris because there's nothing more we like doing than talking ecology. And of course, at the waterhole in front of camp, what a great place to have an adult beverage in the evening, watch the sunset. This is a fantastic way to end a, a day when you're on African safari and when the elephants are coming down to drink. Um, our next stop on this trip is going from Nehemba. We're going to fly you down to Joe's Benini in the deep south. Joe's Benini is arguably the wildest and most remote uh, tourism facility in Zimbabwe and probably in Southern Africa. And we're going to fly you down there uh, in one of Mac Air's wonderful uh, caravan aircraft, turboprop, wonderful $2 million aircraft down, landed Lubuti airstrip and eight kilometers away, five miles away is Joe's Benini. Joe's Benini is old school safari to me, okay? This is, comes takes you back uh, to the good old days of safari. And I'm an old man, I apologize, but I talk about the good old days. Uh, bucket showers under the stars, fantastic. We've got running water. We've got electricity there for you to charge your uh, phones. Um, but these these decks at night that um, when there's not too many lions around, you can drag a, uh, drag your bed out on the deck and enjoy the star bed. Lots of wonderful activities at uh, Josie. Uh, they talk about off the grid, pure remoteness. No doubt, great description of what Josie is. Tents are comfortable. You can see how big they are. Um, uh, nearly 10 meters long, so that's nearly 30 feet long. Stand up inside. We're not talking a pup tent here. Nice and comfortable. Elephants in camp there. You can see the photographs. Warm, friendly staff. Love cooking around the campfire there. You'll have your meals. you have your, your breakfast there. And if you're brave enough and the lions are accommodating, uh, star bed under the stars. And the stars at Josie are just absolutely incredible. Uh, we had one English guest a couple of years ago who said, Joe's Benin is definitely not a five-star camp. It's a five-million-star camp. Oh, it's a great uh, a great description of what Josie is. Um, one of the best things about Josie is about getting out on foot and getting out on bicycle. And there I am on my hands and knees, waxing lyrical again. I've got a bit of a grimace there, but talking about the ecology of how Southern Wangi works. And uh, you're looking at some of these incredible sites. Wangi's most famous for its elephant. Uh, it's about 90% of our biomass. And uh, you can go in vehicle, go on foot. We go on mountain bikes down there, if you would like, if you're up to it. 
And of course, uh, dining under the stars at Joe's Benin when I listen to the elephants and the lions is, uh, it's just absolutely awesome. And as I say, it takes you back to the bygone era of safaris. Um, but one of my best places we love to spend our afternoons is inside the lookup blind. Okay, we buried a 20 foot shipping container uh, and still reinforced it down at uh, toe level, toe nail level amongst the elephants. And it's literally, uh, you can see the elephant there, uh, right sniffing and smelling around the edge there. And just an incredible way to spend two or three hours watching these elephants up close with them, really getting a far more insightful and deeper understanding of uh, some of the interactions that are going on with this fascinating, fascinating mammal. Um, uh, often you get splashed with water you're up, up that close with wild elephant. Hey? These are not habituated elephant. These are wild. Wangi's famous, famous wild elephant. Great photographs. From Joseph Benini, I'm going to take you up to another part of Wangi, okay? And we're going to do a, a road trip across Wangi, and I call it a pump run, which takes me back to the good old days when I was a game ranger. Wangi's unique in that it doesn't have any big rivers. Um, first warden came to Wangi in 1928, found they'd given him 5,000 square mile wilderness without a river in it. And Wangi's elephants would stay here during the their dry season back then, then would leave the park every year and would leave his protection and used to get uh, poached and hunted. And that was the one of the high, um, one of the high years of um, ivory hunting trade in the 1920s and 1930s, during the, the world wars of the 20th century. Where we are today is um, we pump water to uh, maintain our wildlife in Wangi, uh, and this is a historical thing that comes from the windmills that Ted Davison put in the 1930s. We use solar panels today. When we drive north from Josie, we're going to drive north. And we're going to visit and stop off at these water holes where wangis, elephants, and giraffe, and lion, and wildebeest, and everything else drink, you know. And part of one of the things that the guys at Cheesemans have done is they're going to build a conservation element where all of you guys that are buying a safari, a small portion of your safari uh, costs will go into uh, a wildlife uh, game water supply project that we're going to do. And already today I was talking to uh, my team or our team, and we've identified a whole bunch of um, solar uh, technology issues that we want to address for your program next year. And we're probably going to be purchasing uh, a half dozen um, more modern inverters. The inverters that we stuck in about 10 or 11 years ago are, are dated and not as efficient as the modern ones. And that's the kind of program we're looking at to uh, just um, improve our efficiency in our delivery of water to uh, Wangi's Thirsty Herds. And those pictures on the lower right is of a similar project we did a couple of years back where guests visited and uh, donated for actually helping our wildlife here. And believe me, there's nothing quite as wonderful as sitting next to a waterhole and uh, looking at Wangi's elephants enjoying some water. And you know you were partially responsible for delivering that water to these thirsty herds, getting them through the dry season, waiting for the rains. Um, next picture here is uh, a cool one too, because it it tells uh, something else there. You know? It's all these wonderful species that you can see here. For those of you that have visited East Africa, uh, lots of species there, but you probably didn't see a lot of things like sable antelope and roan antelope. And Wangi's famous for our sable and roan. Uh, and you on the pump run, you you will see sable and roan uh, that are part of them. They're just gorgeous, gorgeous uh, antelope that you don't see many of elsewhere in Africa. And of course, there's nothing more fun, in my opinion, than uh, cheeseburgers and salads at one of the water holes when you're halfway up to your next uh, night stop uh, next to one of the water holes. This is at a, a water hole called Mfagazan, which will be... Um, where uh, he has a, a photograph having a picnic lunch there, uh, plenty of cool drinks and maybe some adult beverages before you head on up to your next stop, which is going to be um, next stop on this trip is to uh, Bomani, Bomani Tented Camp. Again, this is a bit of a uh, uh, an old school camp. Some barbering camp was built in the late 1990s. We fixed it up a bit, uh, uh, but it really is wonderful. Charming, old school safari. Um, you see those thatched roofs there. You can see the Serengeti tents, very comfortable inside. Um, they are also 10 meters at 30 feet long, uh, 15 feet wide, ensuite bathrooms, hot and cold running water, electricity in the rooms. We've even got Wi-Fi in the rooms now. And uh, underneath camel thorn trees and looking out across the Ngamo Plains, uh, splash pool there. You can see the wildebeest and stuff coming down here. And of course, a lot more diversity here. At Bamani, you're on the Ngamo Plains. These are the biggest plains in Wangi National Park. Wangi is not famous for savannah grasslands, but here you have a very good chance to see things like cheetah and wild dog and all the wildebeest and things that inhabit the plains that you haven't visited elsewhere on this trip so far. 
And this is just a couple of pictures that Mark put together. And these are pictures he took in one day last year, uh, late season also in the late dry season. Some of the species there, uh, Pride of Lions had made a kill. This was a very short distance from, from Bomani, actually just about a stone's throw. Buffalo herds coming down to drink, cheetah cubs, and uh, cool animals like zebra and all the other stuff there, giraffe and all kinds of things. But uh, just a great place to spend the next couple of days. And of course, in, in Zimbabwe, we're famous for getting on getting on with our wild dogs by getting on foot with them, sneak up in a vehicle, park, everybody disembarks quietly, sit down, and next thing you're on foot with wild dogs. And believe me, I don't know if we can pull it off with your group next year, but we will try. And believe me, there's nothing, nothing as heartwarming, invigorating as being able to be uh, on foot with wild dogs in Wangi National Park. Um, um, our lions there, we've got a huge pride of lions as well. Uh, and the habitual calls, you get some nice pictures here. There's a nice uh, whole bunch of young males and lionesses there, and smiling visitors there, getting some great evening pictures, uh, golden sunlight, uh, golden light for that uh, golden hour in the evenings. We have a lookup line here as well, a pan called Stoffy's Pan, and a great place for any of you who uh, haven't got uh, enough photographs yet to get down uh, in the lookup blind up close with our elephant there at Stoffy's Pan and get a few more pictures. Um, this next picture is coming up. And for the life of me, I can't remember what it is. Here it comes on my screen. Okay, our next stop, one of their great activities here is to go into our local communities. Here it is. And, you know, um, I've seen on safaris throughout Africa community visits but we really, ours are authentic, okay? We really feel that we are embedded amongst our communities. We live there. All of our staff come from walking distance. They come from these villages. Um, there's a picture on the top right there talking with Hedman Johnson Mube. Um, I was with his father in the game department. A couple of his children worked for me. I've known him since he was uh, my, you know, since he was a teenager. He loves to talk to you about things that go on in his village. Great way to start your visit is to actually get out and stretch our legs. We'll walk to school with the kids. A lot of our kids walk up to five miles going to school. We'll walk a couple of miles, walk to school. The kids, great way to break down barriers, not them and them and us, but about suddenly now we're walking together, we're singing a song together, kicking a ball, suddenly finding out each other's names. So by the time we arrive at school in the lower right there for assembly, everybody knows each other and it's become much, much, much less artificial. National Anthem, Lord's Prayer before they start school. And then we go into the classroom, short 15, 10, 15 minutes with the kids uh, and the school teachers and the heads of our schools encourage us to bring visitors for a quick short visit with these kids so the kids learn about tourists are not et you know tourists are people they're part of your community they're coming to come and help your communities here great chance for them to practice english of course much more fun for them than mental arithmetic but a great chance for them to practice english you know one of our national languages and of course important for their futures if they've got a fighting chance for a job and look at the grins on these kids here they're all grinning and smiling for the camera real um unartificial authentic meeting Zimbabwean people, you know. I'm very, very pleased about what develops from these kind of visits. And of course, you'll get to go and visit our rhino. I already told you all about them, Tuza and Kusasa. You're going to go and visit the rhino on foot, in vehicle, and it really is, it's just fantastic. You get up on foot with them. And uh, I love that picture on the lower left there. That was one of the first afternoons I took visitors to go and visit the rhino. The rhino had just come out, and a flipping rainbow came out, and it really uh, came Here's my other stuff, but it's it's really, really awesome. Had a great chance to meet these just wonderful animals that are so threatened by uh, humankind's greediness and uh, and uh, the worst side of uh, human nature. Okay, and once you've finished at Bomani, you're going to be there for four nights. We're then going to, you're going to board my beloved Elephant Express. And the Elephant Express runs up that railway line along the northern boundary of Wangi. You've got an 80-kilometer run, about 50 miles, uh, about a three-hour run going north up to Det Railway Station. And in my opinion, what a great way to finish your visit to National Park. Riding in a rail car, open-sided rail car, and we drive along in our 20-seater rail car, and you can get a chance to drive a train, for goodness sakes. I mean, how good does that get? But you stop and see animals. We see elephants. We see lions. We see sable. We see roan. We see giraffe. We see mongooses, you know? And uh, it's just great. You can stop and take pictures and go forward. We just trundle along at about 20 miles an hour, maybe 25 miles an hour drive it ourselves and stop and take pictures. Um, and uh, Wangi's wildlife uh, has all grown up. The railway line has been there since 1904. So I doubt there's an animal that hasn't grown up with a train. Uh, the video's come on for me. I hope it's come on for you guys. Got a thumbs up. Uh, here it goes. What a great way to travel across Wangi National Park on our beloved Elephant Express. 
um, cold drinks, coffee and tea, adult beverages if you choose them. And uh, how cool is that? We've been on foot with the uh, Wangi's elephants and lions and rhinos and buffaloes. And now uh, we've done it from motor cars. We've done it from bicycles. We've done it from lookup blinds. Now you can do it from a train. Very cool. Just adds to one of the other experiences that you can tuck away into your into your memory bank, which is part of this great trip that Cheesemans have put together for you. And of course, uh, any youngsters we got on the trip, they love, 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 love to drive a train. I do too. Great fun. Probably highly illegal, but we do it. Um, of course, when we arrive at the other end, you disembark and maybe you're lucky enough to see some of our cheetah or lions along the railway track. They love hunting up and down the railway track. And these pictures, a bit, a bit of green season, you see the green grass. When you're there in September, it'll be a lot drier. That was a birthday trip we did the one year. In this case here, these, these pictures are taken disembarking at Bamani. What you guys are going to do, you're going to disembark at the other end up a dead railway station. Dete railway station, small little railway station, which is just a, a two-hour drive from Victoria Falls. You'll disembark at Dete and then board on your um, uh, shuttle bus. It'll take you up the tar road, up to the Palm River Hotel. Palm River is one of the new, uh, it's a hotel, it's a small boutique hotel right on the banks of the Zambezi River. It's beautiful, it's new, service is fantastic, and just a great way to finish off. Nothing nicer than a sundown or cruise that evening on the Zambezi River upstream of the falls, hippos and crocs, beautiful sunsets, adult beverage, and then uh, uh, head back for a lovely dinner at the Palm River and uh, flop into your big comfortable bed, a big comfortable room, and think about all the wonderful things that you've experienced in Zimbabwe. Uh, of course, the next day we'll take you up to the uh, Victoria Falls Airport, and these slides we put in here are going to help you um, just so you can understand a lot of different ways to get to Victoria Falls. Victoria Falls is fast becoming a, a hub in terms of air travel, you can get to it regionally from all these different places throughout Southern Africa, um, either from Cape Town, the direct flights every day, there's flights from Johannesburg every day, there's flights from Harare, which is our nation's capital every day, they're going into the falls. So a lot of ways to get in and out of Victoria Falls. And there's even direct international flights uh, into Victoria Falls. Uh, Ethiopian flies uh, direct, well, I'm not direct, they fly one hop, uh, out of O'Hare and Dulles airports to Addis Ababa, to our layover, and you land in Victoria Falls. You can Kenyan Airways, you can fly direct out of uh, continental North America to via Nairobi to Big Falls and Eurowings via Frankfurt. So all kinds of different ways of opening up, be able to get in and out of Victoria Falls. You don't just have to fly via Joburg. Another great way is to fly via Harare. Uh, Emirates and Qatar fly daily uh, from Doha or Emirates, which hub easily out of North America. Um, and then into Harare, our nation's capital, night over at a comfortable hotel there, and then you can jump on the flight to Victoria Falls the next day on fast jet. And of course, I'm a game ranger, and I'm particularly interested in uh, taking care of communities that are involved in uh, uh, particular area management. And a uh, big thing is that we don't spend the money that you spend with us buying myself a new Mercedes Benz or uh, paying out to international stockholders. We spend our money locally. And uh, very, very proud of our conservation community effort. You'll find a lot of organizations, uh, so-called tourism organizations in Africa, that uh, pay lip service to community conservation. But we do, and you will see it. We've drilled over 100 water wells uh, around the boundary of Rangby National Park. 100 water wells are developing uh, clean, fresh, healthy water to thousands and thousands of families. Uh, our school feeding program in 2019, pre-COVID, we did 500,000 school meals. Okay. Nearly 3,000 per day, over 3,000, nearly 3,000 kids per day were getting meals. Uh, last year in 2022, we did, we built that back up to 420,000 school lunches. Actually, not to 3,000 kids, but to 2,500 kids. We've donated over 65,000 school curriculum, school books. These numbers are easy to roll off, but when you see how remote some of these places are, these are school books delivered to schools where it takes four wheel drive to get two hour drive and four wheel drive off at low range to get to them. And our Smile and Sea Safari. Very proud of them. About to kick that off in about ten days' time, week after next, with thirty doctors that come from overseas, um, and they deliver both eye and oral health care to uh, people in our communities. Uh, and we've done thirty-six thousand patients, maybe a hundred thousand treatments to uh, people around um, Wangi National Park. And this year, we're going to take that number over forty thousand. So, uh, your 
uh, Safari goes a long way to helping this kind of long-term conservation vision. And I spoke earlier about what our rhino have achieved. Huh? Already we've had over 850 school kids have visited these rhino and your tourism conservation levy that you pay as part of this trip goes to uh, providing free health care for these communities around there. Uh, we've created actually nearly 50 local jobs, not 30, since we've opened Century 2. And in an area where um, unemployment is as high as it is, this is fantastic. And this goes to this last slide, you know, we talk a lot about, I call it a holy trinity that may be sacrilegious, but as a conservation, I believe it is. And this is the trinity between wildlife, communities, and visitors. And in many parts of Africa, particularly in Zimbabwe in the bad old days, we had wildlife and communities, but we didn't have visitors. So we didn't have the tourism dollar to, to uh, drive this uh, ecotourism model, conservation model. But as soon as you add tourism to that, and you, and you spend tourism dollars wisely, you can really come up with a sustainable ecotourism conservation model that's got uh, legs for the future. A lot of other parts of Africa, they've had wildlife and visitors, but they've disenfranchised their communities and they're paying a terrible price for that in conservation. But uh, very, very proud of what we're achieving there. And of course, none of it works without support from folks like Cheesemans. And uh, a big, big thank you to you guys for uh, uh, seeing the advantages of uh, taking uh, uh, conservation-minded tourists off of the beaten trail and off of uh, parks that are often uh, too frequently used and bring them to places like ours and uh, experience uh, our part of Africa. And believe me, I know this is a wonderful trip. I've done trips like this one hundreds of times and every single one we have a, a, a heck of a lot of fun. There's a few things that'll go wrong, but nothing too bad that can go wrong. It's very simple. It's easy. Uh, it's uncomplicated and it's just awesome. So any of you that are thinking about You've got some spare time next September. Get hold of Adam, get hold of Patty, and they'll get hold of us and we'll tie it up. And uh, you guys are going to have a, a wonderful, wonderful time. I can't guarantee what you'll see, but I can guarantee you'll have a good time. You'll see things that you'll never, ever forget. Uh, thanks very much for the opportunity to talk to you. And I hope uh, I wasn't talking too fast or too long. But uh, Mark, thanks for the work on the PowerPoint there. Um, Adam, if you guys got any questions or anything you guys want to catch with me here, I've uh, I've got I've got time. I'll talk yep, about a trip sure. like this all night long if you want it. Absolutely. Uh, I'm gonna I'm gonna allow everybody be, to unmute themselves. Uh, we have one question going in the chat right now. How do you stay safe from the big animals? Okay, so uh, there's a lot of ways to answer this, but one of the ways that that I do is every time I travel to the United States, I drive down a six lane highway and I am white knuckle terrified. Okay, because I'm not used to it. I don't know what I'm doing. I can drive down the road with one of you guys and you know what you're doing, so I'm perfectly safe. So the same thing happens in Wangi National Park, okay? We've been doing this all our lives. Everything that we can take you to do there, we do with our children, okay? There's nothing that I'm going to take you to do that I don't do with my own daughters. And uh, we know what's safe, okay? And a lot of it is about understanding uh, animals and body language, okay? I can look at an elephant and any of my pro guides with us here and look at an elephant and tell you with, hang on, that's a relaxed elephant? Well, hang on. That's an elephant we need to give space to. That's a lion that's relaxed. He's lying on his back with his feet in the air, for goodness sakes, and he's yawning. This is not a dangerous lion. Over there, however, is a lion that's lying down flat, ears flat, whipping his tail. This is a lion we're going to have space to. So that's how we take care of things. We carry a rifle, uh, but touch wood. I've never had to shoot an animal in self-defense in my life in Wangi National Park, and I hope it stay. I hope I died with that uh, still being my uh, record. So we can take care of you. We know how to do it. But the main thing is about not putting into dangerous situations. And we can assess what's a dangerous situation. Not unlike you might do driving down a six-lane highway when you see a 30-ton Oshkosh that's weaving from lane to lane. You give it space, for goodness sakes. It doesn't take much more than common sense to know that. Uh, it's the same thing with elephants and lions, once you know how. Does that, I hope that answer the question. Uh, what about, uh, I think it did. Uh, Marilyn wants to know about vaccinations and medications. I'm sure that varies. Patty, you might be able to help with this as well. Okay, as we are at now, I'm not a medical practitioner, so I'm not licensed to be able to give you any medical advice. Personally, I can tell you, get hold of uh, the folks at Cheesemans and they'll they'll give you the advice there. What I will tell you though, is I know, because I raised families here and I've lived here all my life, is that Zimbabwe and our part of Zimbabwe is amazingly safe. Okay, September, we are a malaria area. The chances of you catching malaria are remote. None of us take malaria prophylactics at that time of year. Okay, your medical practitioners there will recommend you take one, but the chance of catching malaria are extremely, extremely remote. 
Uh, we don't have yellow fever here like you have to get yellow fever vaccinations for East Africa. You don't need it for Zimbabwe. Um, you're, um, you are, we have medical um, uh, insurance where we can get you to uh, good health care uh, very quickly. Um, to be a, a pro guide in Zimbabwe, you have to be a, a, a licensed uh, first aid practitioner. We do carry medics boxes, but we'd always recommend to travelers. You've got um, items of a, a medical nature that you require personally bring them. Don't be shy to bring your personal medications, but throw in some triple antibiotic, throw in some Band-Aids, throw in some uh, mild painkillers, some antihistamines, some stuff. If you get a sting from an unwanted insect, you can take care of it. But if you don't have it, we've got it in our medics boxes. So uh, we'll take care of you. Our elevation here is nearly 3,000 feet. So we're relatively high elevation. You're not talking uh, the lowlands of Tanzania and the Sulu Game Reserve or tropics of Zaire or something like that. It's a very healthy uh, environment. September, daytime temperatures might get into the 90s, but humidity is almost zero. Nighttime temperatures are going to drop down to the 60s or 70s. It's nice sleeping weather. You're going to sleep under a blanket or two in September next year. So it's healthy, very few bugs. Uh, and dry as a bone, crystal clear skies. Said by September like, next year, we won't have had rain for six months. So the amount of insects around are very slim and not many not many diseases. I hope that answers the question. Mm -hmm. Patty, do you have anything you want to add? Um, the only thing I have to add is actually we were there at the end of the rain, right after the rainy season, and I didn't even encounter any mosquitoes or anything then, but all of the lodging has... Um, mosquito repellents and lotions and all that for you so you don't even have to worry about you know packing all of those things it's good info uh okay how about uh is there a plan a plan in place to put male and female rhinos together to hopefully grow the population yeah so that's that's the vision for um for this wider conservancy so uh the current thinking from uh, uh the rhino experts that i uh, listen to is that what we want to try and do is get bulls established okay because if we have bulls established and then add more bulls to the mix these guys that come off the trucks are going to be disorientated and discombobulated and frankly half tranquilized so they're going to run into problems with any bulls that are already there so the thinking is to get the bulls settled in once we've got all the bulls settled in then we bring in females and now we have a free and then link those concerns those sanctuary together for this free ranging conservancy and this is something that's going to roll out over the next few years sanctuary two is going to open in the early part of next year with our next batch of rhinos and i'm hoping within the next five years you guys come back for your second trip in uh 2029 uh you'll be able to have a uh, experience of free ranging rhino conservancy how do the rhinos typically react to visitors okay so what's very cool about these rhinos even though they're wild rhino when they came off the trucks they were wild and they ran away from us but what's happened, because our model is to guard these rhino 24-7, okay? We are perceived to be a high-risk environment. These rhino are in a place where they were once poached out of completely. So we guard them 24-7. So what's happened is over the years, is or over, over the months when they arrived, these rhino became habituated to the cobra rangers. These cobra rangers are walking around them day and night. Uh, and white rhino are social animals, which makes them very, very interesting too, or different to black rhino. These white rhino like to be part of a social structure. And these cobra ranges have quite apparently become part of their social structure. So you'll see them, they're often looking around middle of the day, looking for a place to flop down in, in a, a shady spot. They look to see where the cobra ranges go and flop down next to them, um, which means when we're on foot with them and you walk with the cobra ranges, you can have this incredible experience uh, with these rhino. I often walk around the other side to take a picture of them and they'll run away from me. So they're not habituated to people just wandering around, but you're with the Cobra Rangers, you, you can have this incredible experience. So it's it's kind of, it's it's very, very cool. And it's been a something I didn't anticipate would be uh, what it's turned out to be, but it's turned out better than I dreamed or hoped for. Yeah, we were, we were, I can speak to that as a traveler. We were so close to those um, rhinos um, and the Cobra Rangers look tough and they are in their jobs, but they were so full of personality and had so much affection for the rhinos. Um, and so much pride in their work. We just enjoyed being out there talking with them, hanging out with the rhinos who were just super close. And uh, we asked the Cobra Rangers if they ever petted the rhinos. And they were like, oh no, that's like, that was an absurd question, but they're, they're right there with them within, you know, feet of them and just have a 
really tender relationship, strangely, with these giant animals. It, it's really beautiful. If anybody else has any questions, you guys can drop them in the chat. Or if you want to unmute yourself, you're more than welcome to. Give it a couple minutes. Uh, well, I have a question about the safety of from the big animals. What about the ones like the lions and the elephants uh, when you're that close, like sitting on a patio or a deck? And I know it looks like really alarming to me. But <laughs> so, um, yeah, that's my question, which, you know, I guess it must be okay because you, you guys are talking about it, but it does seem a little worrisome to me. And so I just wondered how that was that you could get that close to lions and not be alarmed. Um, so I can, that's, yeah, go ahead. That's a real, a real interesting question. And it goes back to, because I've been in Wangi so long, I, I, I can really answer that because I've seen it happen over the years. So when Nehimba Lodge was first built, uh, the elephant didn't just arrive and start drinking out of the swimming pool. That slowly developed over time. And what's happened over time, that lodge has been there more than 10 years now, is that the elephants have become used to people sitting on the patio. Okay? And they've literally become habituated to people sitting on the patio. Okay? So provided you sit on the patio, they just go about their business. They're just coming in to drink. They're not angry elephant. Uh, Wangi's elephant are famous for having been so well protected through their, through their history. They don't have a it's obviously you treat every single one with respect. They they're dangerous animals, but they're not an angry elephant population. I've been with elephants in East Africa and stuff where you really they're really unpredictable. And Wangi's elephants are not like that. Provided you stay on the patio, it's fine. Now, however, if you walk around the other side of those elephants, they will freak out. They get a complete fright because they're not used to that. And the same applies with those lions. Those pictures I showed you with the lions that are with us in a vehicle park nearby. Now those lions have grown up in that area. Uh, and some of those lions seven, eight years old, perhaps, but there's been uh, tourists from overseas have been visiting the lodges there for the past 10 to 15 years. So those lions grew up as cubs in that pride with people in game drive vehicles nearby them, completely used to that, provided you sit still and quietly in the vehicle, they're habituated to that. If, however, you jump up and down and jump on the roof, those lions will freak out. So again, and we will talk you through that. So it looks dangerous, but it's about what the animals are used to and what they're habituated with. Now, if you're doing something like that, and we will be around you, we will explain to you, we can look at that animal and say, hey, that lion is perfectly comfortable with us being there because we can read its body language. It's like you can read the body language of a person when you walk into, I don't know, you might walk into a supermarket or something in the States. You can see somebody who's running around swinging a chain and He's obviously crazy with drugs in his head or something. I don't know. But you can see the body language versus uh, some lady walking along, pushing a shopping cart who's perfectly relaxed. So when you get used to it, you can read animals' body language like that. When we can see the animal, the elephants are perfectly relaxed. We know we're relaxed. If we see something happening where the animals are agitated or something like that, we'll immediately say to you, hey, guys, let's pull back. Uh, but our job, we're paid to take care of you. And like I say, uh, um, we will do it to the best of our ability. And uh, I certainly don't want to get killed. By, by an elephant. I don't want to get killed by anything. I'm enjoying life far too much. So uh, we will take care of you and ensure, ensure that everybody's a couple. But what makes it exciting is these unique kind of experiences. You're not sitting in a car looking at elephants over there. Here's this chance to sit down and have these elephants right up close where you can smell them and you can see them right up close. And it is so, I mean, the hair on my arms just stands up every time it happens, even though it's happened so often to me. And it's safe. I do it with my daughters. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah, um, I could comment a bit on that as far as just having such a comfort and trust in the uh, the guides, um, just like Butch, they're, you know, you train six to 10 years to be guides in Zimbabwe. And um, we were told at Josie, because it's a lesser visited park, um, that the wildlife wasn't quite as used to the travelers. And so we were not allowed to be as close to the lions um, just because they, they knew they know the animal behavior so well. They know what's comfortable for the animals and what's you know what's putting too much stress on the animal. So I feel like as travelers, you would just have such a great comfort level um, with with the team that's there looking out for you. I never felt 
uncomfortable, except for one time I stood up in the safari vehicle when we were in the middle of a lot of lions and um, the guide said, sit down, sit down, sit down. And I sat down and everything was fine. But like Butch said, they don't want to see you jumping up just, you know, to just kind of blend in. And it just felt very safe to me. Yeah. And I say this, Patty, to add to that, uh, the Zim guides are just the training level that they have to go through to be a pro walking guide is quite extensive. So for me, that's then the quite a few safaris. I definitely trust a Zim guide to, to, to walk me through the park than, than any other guides, maybe Zambians, but Bush could argue with me, me on that one. Um, <laughs> but, but it, I, I think it's that, that level of certification. It is very, very hard to become a, a Zimbabwean pro guide. They don't just take anyone from the street. You know, you need to, to have the level of 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 guiding to reach that uh, pro guide level. Butch, uh, someone asked if you plan to place a black rhino anytime soon. I don't know if that's bringing one in or placing one in the wild. Yeah, so, so part of our vision for the future of that rhino conservancy is for white and black rhino. Okay, we're kicking off with white because frankly, white are more easy to manage. Okay, uh, black rhino, you can't close quarter guard black rhino. They are just too cantankerous. So what was really important here was for us to have success, certainly in the early phases here. So we wanted to make sure that we that we could do that. And white rhino, the easy rhino. But yes, definitely. Uh, like I say, you come back on that safari in 2029, uh, not only will be free-ranging uh, white rhino with females there, but I'm hoping you'll see some black rhino wandering around there too. Uh, that is our vision for the future. But we have to do it very carefully. It's step by step. Communities have to be on board. And there's no sense just bringing a whole lot of rhino and keeping our fingers crossed. We have to build capacity to look after them. And this is crucial. In other parts of Africa, there's been a lot of rhino introductions and they've lost a lot, frankly, because they didn't have the capacity on the ground to take care of those rhino. Um, and that doesn't come easily. It comes with time and training. And we're doing it the hard way. We're doing it the right way. Uh, and God willing, uh, it's going to work. And then how about birds? Uh, how are the local guides and yourself with all of the bird community? We have, I'm sure we have birders in the audience. Yeah. So, so you know, uh, you won't find a Zimbabwean guide that's not nuts about birds, okay? Um, birds we're very, very proud of. Uh, Wangi National Park, Victoria Falls area, has the highest avian diversity of any park in Zimbabwe and one of the highest avian diversity of any park in Gaza, frankly. Uh, and Mark's a big birder as I am. And you saw that picture of all those birds he took in one day there that he showed you. All kinds of cool birds, uh, different things that you might not have seen. So, yes, um, one of the requirements of becoming a guide in Zimbabwe uh, to get your guiding license. And I used to be an examiner. I don't examine anymore, but I examined for many years. We take you out for a week into a park and you better know every single damn bird we see. And you better uh, be able to identify every damn bird call we hear. Otherwise... Frankly, you're probably not going to pass. We're going to tell you come back next year. So we're not 100% on our birds, but uh, we certainly will be. And anybody who likes to see birds, man, we love it. We love it. So if you're a bird watcher, come on in. We'll have fun. <laughs> love it. Does anybody else have any more questions? All right. If nobody has anything else, we'll do an adieu. Folks, I'm going to post right now all of our trip itinerary. Patty, who's a wildlife safari coordinator, her contact info is in there as well as our social stuff. So you can follow us. I want to start and finish by thanking both Mark and Butch for the presentation. It's completely robust. Um, the comments in the chat have been phenomenal. You guys did an awesome job. We hope that this stirs up a lot of interest about Zimbabwe and what you guys are doing and the efforts that you guys are making. They're absolutely phenomenal. Folks, if you guys have any questions, never hesitate to reach out to Patty or anybody at Cheeseman's. You can reach us by phone, email, uh, or on our website. Thank you guys so, so very much. What a great way to start our morning, at least here on the West Coast. Um, this, what a great presentation. Thank you so much, guys. I appreciate it. Thank, Thank you. Thank you. Guys, uh, also, I'm going to be putting the recording of this video up on YouTube in the next 24 hours. So anybody that missed it, or if you want to watch it again, you should be able to find it. Um, I'll post that on our website, as well as our social, so you guys can find it and send an email out to this entire group. So you get a, a link for that as well. Thanks, guys. I appreciate it. Everybody have a great day today. Ooh.